Welcome back, yeah, <laughs> film club people. What's going on? It's Carson. Look, I'm getting better. Ha. Um, yeah, what's going on, everybody? We watched another film this week. I hope you got a chance to check it out. We watched Black Orpheus. Had you heard of it before? Had you seen it before? Whether you had or not, if you watched it this week, then you participated, and I'm proud of you. <clears throat> yes, Black Orpheus, or as it's more uh, appropriately called, Orfeo Negro. Uh, I don't speak Portuguese, so I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, pitch perfect or anything, but uh, we got Groot here, got the tree, and we're back, baby, so we're here talking about Black Orpheus. Uh, it is from 1959. It's by Marcel Camus, who is a French filmmaker who worked down in Brazil for this one. It is based off a play, and yes, that play is uh, based on the Orpheus and Eurydice myth from Greek mythology, and it was called Orfeo du Carnival or something like that, and it's about Orpheus in Carnival in Rio, which is where we have our film taking place. And if you are familiar with the Orpheus and Eurydice story, which I'm sure you are because it gets, uh, it gets retold many a time. Uh, in fact, it just recently won uh, a best musical at the Tonys last year for Hades Town. Way down, Hades Town, way down under the ground. Did you see that? Well, uh, that is Orpheus and Eurydice, and so is this. And uh, they do a very good job of uh, modernizing it for this uh, Brazilian version. Uh, we follow Orpheus, who seems to work on some kind of trolley or something there in Rio, and uh, is a very well-liked, very well-loved member of the town. He's about to get married to the beautiful Mina. Was it Mina or Mira? I think it's Mina, uh, who is just... I mean, if, if, you, if you put on this movie and you've never heard of it before, one thing that you're gonna figure out really quickly is that that Mina chick is really hot. And that's the point. She's supposed to be the physical embodiment of all things that are exotic and, and feminine uh, and powerful. Uh, and then in walks uh, our stranger to the town, someone who doesn't seem to be from here. Uh, and we find out a little later who she is, and she is our dear Eurydice. I loved, there was a scene right towards the beginning that just perfectly put me where I needed to be. Uh, Orpheus and Mina have gone to the city clerk or whoever they're supposed to go to to go get their marriage license <clears throat> and the clerk asks his name and he says Orpheus and he laughs and says oh so you must be Eurydice and she's like what who's Eurydice and she gets all mad at Orpheus and he's like you don't know the story and so we get uh we get told pretty early that this is not we're not living in a world where no one has heard of this story uh we're actually going to kind of mirror it and tell it for the hundred millionth time and it's even so lovely how it unfolds. Of course, they do meet in a chance encounter, and uh, him and him and Eurydice, they 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 fall very quickly for one another. But uh, one thing that I, I really just appreciated was that he he and her kind of hint at the idea that they know one another, uh, or that they're destined to be in love with each other. Uh, she even says how she remembers his song, not the words but the melody, and we see very quickly he kind of turns. Uh, in the scene with the two of them kind of turns a little somber and melancholy. You kind of get this sense that uh, he has perhaps lived this tragic fate over and over and over again and is, and is all the more willing to do it again for perhaps the millionth time. We don't know. Uh, as the two of them have their, you know, they try to link together in secret and duck Mina who, and they're helped out by their really awesome friend, Serafina who, uh, God, she was, she's just so lively and she's just such a good pal. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, the actress who played Serafina uh, just is, is so, so energetic and so alive. Uh, this film is also uh, highly regarded for being one of the first uh, international art films to have an entirely black cast, which is kind of cool. Um, and, and also I did find myself while I was watching it, I was like, man, this is so cool to see. This right here is something that I can't find very many of, you know, pre-1980. How, how many films can you find where, where you're, you're dealing with stories that aren't just white picket fences and 50s Americana? Um, I mean, obviously there was tons of film happening all over the world during the 50s, but not enough of it 
uh, was dealing with uh, these beautiful people, especially in this film, these, these Brazilian people. Uh, the main guy, the guy who plays Orpheus, was discovered on the street. The director found him on the street. Pretty much all the actors in this film are, are like not professional actors. Um, only one of them was American. The woman who plays Eurydice is from Pittsburgh, apparently. Uh, she speaks great Portuguese. Um, but yeah, bossa nova music very much came to America uh, because of this movie. Um, there, there weren't many uh, hip households in the 60s that weren't playing some kind of samba bossa nova music. If you know the song Girl From Ipanema, that song is written by one of the guys who was one of the two guys who wrote the score for this film. And uh, it kind of plays out very much like a musical. You kind of get this the same energy you would get from a musical. Um, I did find, uh, especially towards the beginning, there is this just incessant beat. And it's almost a little cacophonous and, and like a, a, a bit of a racket at first, um, at least for me. But, but then I started to get swept up in the rhythm and, and the feeling and spirit of Carnival and I've never been, but I'd love to go. Sorry, Groot, did I bump you? Um, I would love to go and it seemed like a great time. I will say, um, I have this book here. Um, this is like one of my very favorite things ever, 1001 Movies to See Before You Die. But in here, for the write-up of Black Orpheus, uh, it says this. Ironically, in Brazil, the film is perennially criticized for exoticizing the country as an all-night dance party populated by hot-blooded Latin caricatures. Although it is difficult to argue with these criticisms, which highlight many contemporary debates about visibility politics, the film is best appre sorry, this film is best appreciated on its own merits. So, while I was watching the film, and mind you, I only have the one perspective, and that is of a American straight white male. So um, there's a lot of things that, sadly, I, I might not notice right away, but I'm always, you know, willing to learn as best I can. Um, but for, for this thing in particular, I was watching it, and I, I kind of was getting a sense that, like, it, it's got a little bit of it's a small world after all going on, and yet uh, it also felt kind of uh, real enough for a retelling of a myth. We're dealing with a fable, a mythic, a mythic uh, relationship. Um, and uh, so, so there, there were things that I was able to forgive that other audience members might not be able to so quickly. And you know, that is um, so, something that I, I get to deal with as an audience member. And um, yeah, this, uh, the main controversy being that some people find it to be a, a very charming, light-hearted film, and others find it to be, uh, to use this word, exoticizing of the Brazilian people. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I know uh, from movies like City of God and no personal experience, really, uh, that the favelas in Rio are uh, very scary places to be, and in this film it seems like a great dance party. And uh, I think that, you know, this film, especially being made in the 50s, was was uh, able to benefit a little bit from just focusing on the joy that is found amongst these poor people. Um, a couple other scenes that I just loved, there's a scene where uh, there's these two little boys that are just like obsessed with Orpheus and uh, they, they ask him, is it true that you play the guitar and it makes the sun rise? And uh, he's like, of course it's true. And so there's this cool scene where uh, the, the boys come to, to Orpheus's little hut and he has, you know, like a baby goat and chickens and a puppy and a kitten all in there. And these two little boys, and I, I think one of them gives Orpheus the guitar. And then the two boys kind of like quiet the other little animals. And they kind of cuddle up with all of them. And Orpheus starts playing this beautiful song that kind of recurs throughout the film. And it's just this little moment where Orpheus is just serenading the children of the world. And, uh, and it's this nice little respite from the of the film. Uh, and then, you know, mirrored with the ending of the film. So, spoiler alert a little bit, um, towards the end of the film, you know, Eurydice has been electrocuted by the hands of Orpheus, and it's so sad. But he goes to try and find her, and in the original myth, he goes to the underworld to find her, and he has to bring her back, and he's not allowed to look at her, and it's this whole thing. But uh, for our purposes in this version, um, Orpheus is distraught. He's trying to look for her. He knows that she's in a hospital somewhere. She, she can't possibly be dead. 
and she, he's looking all over and he goes to the missing persons area and there's this lonely janitor on a long hall and there's just like papers floating about and Orpheus is looking for a missing person and this little sweeper guy is like, sorry man, there, there's no people up here, there's just all of this paperwork about it and you see just a mountain of papers and uh, Orpheus is just crushed of course but this, this sweeper man uh, he says, I, I, know, I know how to help you, I can take you there. And we go down and we find this big spiral staircase that leads down and down into black. And then of course this little square of red light is shown. And I was like, that's awesome. Cause that's the coolest way to keep with the myth, uh, but not leave the reality of the story that we're doing. So their trip to the underworld uh, was a very cool spiral staircase down to this red light. Um, and then that ending with, you know, Orpheus and Eurydice are both perished. And uh, the two boys, uh, one shows up and runs with the guitar. And he says, quick, you have to play so that the sun will rise. And he goes, I don't know how to play the guitar. And he's, anyway, he just starts playing a beautiful thing. And this little girl comes up and she goes, did you make the sun rise? And you kind of start to see that it's like, ah, this story will be told again and again and again. Um, and so it was just such a beautiful, such a beautiful film. No wonder it won a bunch of awards. Um, there's actually a great video clip on YouTube of this film winning best foreign film at the Oscars. And the guy opens the envelope and he goes, whoa, Black Orpheus. And so it was kind of cool to think that it was like that film that people wanted to win. And then uh, the producer gets up, does his speech all in French. Then Bob Hope says, uh, for those of you who don't know, he just said, I did it all myself. And uh, it's just a great, great throwback. Love old movies, man. Love this club. Love you guys. Uh, it's a long video, so I'm glad you made it all the way here. Uh, of course, we're going to keep on going. we got another pick coming for you tomorrow. Uh, in the meantime, go ahead and try and catch Black Orpheus whenever you can, because it is so good. And throw on some Bossa Nova music, baby. <laughs> Gostou da dupla e fez também. Vem, vem, vem. Olhou pro cisne e disse assim: Vem, vem. Que o um quarteto fica.